There are some quite nice studies showing that the, this Lactobacillus rhamnosus GG, which is an, an Finnish invention, invention actually, and is the best or most well well known probiotic in the world. So, so it uh, decreases carrier's occurrence a bit, and also also uh, decreases levels of mutant streptococci. That has been done done in a few studies. We are looking at the same thing with the Bifidobacterium lactis BB12 which is a Danish, Danish invention, and they also sell it a lot in USA. Um, there is also a bacteria called Lactobacillus reuteri, um, which, is, which is used in, in products called Rela, and, and that has been shown in several studies to decrease levels of mutant streptococci. So when we have been discussing with, with US experts about uh, Lactobacilli and Bifidobacteria, so most come up with the concern that, that they would promote carriers, but there are so far no indications of anything like that, and, and only indications of, of that that they could be, be of benefit from oral health, and not, not at least for, for any negative effects. Are we talking about directly applied? We're not talking about tablets that are swallowed. Uh, you could, you, we, we are talking about probiotics in products, so that they would be eaten, that they would be, for example, in yogurt, or they would be in milk, like we have it in Finland. If you if you if you use probiotics as tablets, so they are dissolving in in the stomach only, so they are not going to affect the oral health in any way. But they have very good effects for for general health. A friend of mine, Professor Seppa Salminen, who is a very very good investigator of of, of gastrointestinal intestinal tract uh, bacteria. He's actually of the opinion that xalitol could be a prebiotic, that it would be promoting uh, bifidogenic bacteria, but we don't have any proof on that. But, but uh, if there is anything, so he thinks it's a prebiotic. He has some cow studies supporting this. Uh, there are some very good studies done by Professor Uhari from Finland. He comes from Oulu. He's a pediatrician. And they had done very nice studies with, with xylitol preventing ear infections. So there is really clinical data on this. I didn't mention this with regards to orthodontics, but our orthodontist in back there, Dr. Hassey, uh, he can tell us that um, one way to certainly produce a malocclusion is to pinch off the nasal airway. If, you don't, if you're not able to breathe easily through, through the nose, you pinch that off. You breathe through the mouth, you're going to create a malocclusion, probably narrow arches, crowded teeth. So during the developmental period, it's very important to prevent these ear infections and these uh, upper airway infections. I think the xylitol nasal spray, Dr. Jones has plenty of evidence using the xylitol nasal spray, will help open that airway and with easier nasal breathing, we'll be able to prevent some of these developing malocclusions. Yeah, xylitol certainly is not a panacea, that's quite clear, but uh, its use, because of its pentitol nature, can be associated with lowered, uh, reduced uh, levels of those bacteria, like some pneumococci and so forth. So there are two pieces, two, two papers have been published on that by Dr. Ohari in all. Uh, by the way, it doesn't matter in which form you introduce solitol into the, into the oral cavity. It can, be, it can be in the form of a pacifier, it can be in the form of chewing gum, or, or, uh, or a syrup, syrup, syrup-like solitol product. When Professor Mackinnon was doing the Turku sugar studies, the, the subjects were eating hundreds of grams of xylitol per day, and when they got adapted to it, so, so it was just fine. But a lot of people get some gastrointestinal pro problems when they go to doses about 20 grams per day. So that is why we are recommending xylitol to be used in small products, and you are not supposed to bake cakes of that or anything. So you, you are supposed to use it in the form where it can be stopping the acid production. And I want to also mention it here that if you put xylitol into a product which has natural sugars, so if you do a jelly with xylitol, so that means that if you have there, there are sugars from, from the, for example, strawberries or whatever, so that will in a certain way abolish the effect of xylitol because there is some competition between natural sugars and xylitol. So you are supposed to 
eat first all the natural sugars and and then after that xylitol or xylitol as a snack where it's totally totally harm, harmless but the 20 gram per day is something that that people usually tolerate well well but we go with the five to six because that's realistic since xylitol has been available as a sweetener with a xylo sweet for instance here uh, we've known a lot of people um, and especially diabetic people who have been adding significant amounts of xylitol to their diet without any problems whatsoever. Uh, I have here a, a mainstream product that I found recently. It's a sugar-free jello pudding and it has xylitol as the primary sweetener right after water on the label. It's very surprising for a mainstream product. Sometimes they'll add a little bit of xylitol because xylitol does have a nice sweetness and a quick release and then they'll have the artificial sweetener to keep the sweetness going longer. Um, but in, in this case, uh, they, uh, one of these little pudding cups actually has six grams of xylitol, which is very unusual to have a mainstream product with that much xylitol in it. But it's just to, uh, uh, to let you know that, that people are able to tolerate considerable amounts of xylitol. If they have a little time to adapt. With the dental products, we have no problem, really. Uh, the amounts are so small, and they're in divided amounts. Also, if you have something on your stomach, um, you'll have less, uh, for instance, using xylitol right after eating, you'll have less problems with it. So probably that's why there aren't very many complaints with, the, uh, with these pudding cups, because uh, people are using them as a dessert. They're using them after eating. Uh, there's something on the stomach, and, and uh, xylitol is not as likely to... Uh, to go through as rapidly as if you had a, a big glass of lemonade with a lot of xylitol in it on an empty stomach. They just drink it down with a, a liquid. Yeah. That's a big difference probably. Yeah. I also want to emphasize here that, that any other polyol would be also, if you are sensitive to xylitol, so you would be sensitive to sorbitol and maltitol, oh, so they are just the same. Let, let's mention that because in the in, uh, United States, for example, we've got a lot of maltitol mm. products that came out um, uh, with a diabetic claim on them early on, and especially maltitol chocolate. Maltitol tastes very good. It's, mm. it's, a, it's a, like a disaccharide, like a, it's a dimeric polyol. It has a glucose part and a sorbitol part. And it was supposed to have only half the potential osmotic load of a, a normal polyol because it's a dimeric polyol. It, what it turned out for a lot of people was to be worse than xylitol. And, and you don't get adapted to it. And the diabetic people who would say, oh, good, now finally I have a chocolate that tastes like chocolate. And they have a big box of maltitol mm -hmm. chocolate. And then from that time on, if you say sugar, alcohol, or polyol, you, you might you might want to duck. <laughs> <laughs> but um, uh, maltitol, I'd, I'd say, it is has given poly uh, polyol, sugar, alcohol is kind of a bad name because they because they came out with suppose some kind of mainstream products that people really overdid the use of them and, and had a lot of trouble with them. Mm -hmm. I find that myself, even with maltitol, I can't tolerate very much, whereas mm -hmm. I can eat xylitol um, pretty much like sugar without any effect because I've been using it for so long. Mm -hmm. uh, so um, amongst the polyols, I would, I would be a lot more afraid of sorbitol and maltitol, and especially mannitol which they use as a dusting on a lot of the sugar-free chewing gums, has a lot worse potential for laxative effect than xylitol does. And I want to also emphasize that when we are talking about this laxative effect, so it's just a little bit unpleasant, it, it passes right away. So those people who are sensitive to that, that would be about 5% or so, so they know about that. Most people can be adapted very easily to, to xylitol. It's very difficult to differentiate between lactose intolerance effects related that also can cause laxative effects.